the centuries-long apocalypse of the First Blight was over, and although civilization on Thedas had survived, it was left deeply scarred. In a world where the lacerations the Archdemon had cleaved across the land were still raw, the stage was set for the humbling of the greatest empire humanity had ever known, and the spread of the Chant of Light across the land. Welcome to our third episode on the history of the world of Dragon Age, where we will cover the exalted March of Andraste, the Lady of Restitution, the Bride of the Maker, and the founding mother of the most dominant religion on Thedas. After suffering the intergenerational ravages of the First Blight, the Tevinta Imperium was not the juggernaut it had once been. While the Darkspawn had been driven back underground, the environmental devastation they had left on the land was still causing droughts, landslides, wildfires and famine. As supply lines buckled, the Imperium was forced to abandon many of its furthest outposts, reducing its ability to project power onto the barbarian tribes on their borders. In the heartland, people lashed out over the betrayal of their old god, Dumat, causing massive social unrest between the general population and the Empire's ruling magisters. As the Empire fractured from within, the aforementioned barbarians on society's fringes were on the up and up. While the Blight had hit them too, it had not been as hard, and in its wake, they had begun to consolidate their small, squabbling tribes into political units capable of challenging imperial might. One example of this occurred when Eldarath, a powerful Alamari chief who ruled lands in what is now northern Ferelden, married a Syrian clan leader named Brona, allying with the tribes of what is now central Orle. In the year 203 before the founding of the Chantry, the joining of Eldarath and Brona produced a daughter, Andraste the girl destined to become the martyred prophet of, by far, the most dominant religion on Thedas. In the modern day, the most comprehensive account of Andraste's life is found in the Chant of Light, the religious liturgy of the Chantry. Like all holy scripture, the chant has been remoulded several times over the centuries, with the true story of its prophetess touched up and snipped at to present a narrative that inspires conformity and obedience in its believers. As such, we should be careful not to take the Chant of Light at face value as a religious document, but neither will we ignore its usefulness in piecing together Andraste's saga. Tragedy befell the young Andraste in early life. The girl had grown up with her half-sister, Halasere, who Eldarath had sired with a concubine. According to later historical testimony, when both girls were children, Andraste noticed Halasere wandering into the forest, entranced by a flashing of mysterious lights. Andraste followed her sister into the trees. What happened next has been lost to time. All that is known is that when the pair were found, Halasere lay dead amidst a clearing scorched by fire, with Andraste still alive but shaken and unsure of what she had seen. After this incident, Andraste would be plagued, or blessed depending on your point of view, by fits and seizures, in which she would go into a stupor and receive strange, unearthly visions. Upon maturing into young adulthood, Andraste was betrothed to Matharath, another powerful chieftain of the Alamari, who controlled much of what is now Eastern Ferelden. Their marriage precipitated the largest alliance of barbarian tribes ever seen forging a confederacy which stretched across most of southern Thedas south of the Waking Sea. The pair would not enjoy marital bliss for long. Sometime after minus 187 Ancient, a Tevinta raiding party thundered into Andraste's home village with spell and steel born, killing her father, Eldarath, and taking her as a slave. Following this, Mafarath became the most powerful barbarian leader in southern Thedas, assuming control of the confederacy forged by his late father-in-law. However, Eldarath had been an extremely popular leader, and as such, the loyalties of many of the sub-chiefs under Mafarath's command were contingent on his ability to return the old chieftain's legacy, his daughter, back to her rightful place among her people. It is unclear how long Andraste languished under the chain of the Tevinters, but eventually her husband was able to negotiate her release presumably for a queen's ransom in tribute. Back among her people, Andraste reflected upon her time in slavery, languishing in sorrow for those she had left behind, 
the countless enslaved peoples, be they of the Alamari, the other tribes of men or elves, who still suffered under the bitter sting of the Magister's whip. Seeking guidance in how she might bring salvation to these tortured souls, Andraste turned to the traditional animist gods of her people, the spirits of the trees and the waters, but found only silence as her reply. During these mournful days, Andraste's visions intensified, and in them, a divine voice began to sing to her. Heart that is broken beats still unceasing, an ocean of sorrow does nobody drown. You have forgotten, spear made of Alamar, within my creation none are alone. Indeed, if the chant of light is to be believed, then it is here that Andraste received her first conclave with the maker of the world, the speaker of the first word, the one true god of Thedas. The maker revealed that all men, elves and dwarves were his children, but they had since turned their backs on him, prostrating themselves before dragons and demons. He elucidated that the world had once been a paradise, and the Golden City had been made for mankind to take their place by his side one day. However, when the endless greed of the Magister Sidereal had sought to usurp heaven from him, spurred on by the whispers of their heathenous dragon overlords, he had been forced to turn his back on his beloved children, abandoning man to their false idols and letting them waste away in a world polluted by corruption, misery and blight. So it was that Andreste realized the truth and spoke in a heavy heart. I saw the black city, towers all stained, gates once bright golden forever shut, heaven filled with silence. Then did I know all and crossed my heart with unbearable shame. Burning with compassion for her people, Andraste begged the Maker to give mankind a second chance. Reluctantly, God agreed, charging Andraste to be his prophet. Only once all peoples across all four corners of the earth had welcomed he back into their hearts as their one true deity, would the Maker return unto the earth and turn it into the paradise that was promised. For you, Song Weaver, once more I will try. To my children venture, carrying wisdom. If they but listen, I shall return. Thus charged with a new divine purpose, Andraste began preaching to her people. Through her as its conduit, the cult of the Maker began to spread like wildfire among the Alamari, who latched on enthusiastically to one of the holy tenets Andraste preached, that magic should serve man rather than rule over him a particularly appealing dictate for the men and women who had languished for centuries under the tyranny of Tevinta's sorcery. Soon, Andraste's ambitions expanded beyond her own people. After all, the Maker had declared that only when his chant of light had spread across all the world would paradise be restored, and much of the world was still under the rule of an empire where magic still ruled over man, where thousands spent their lives in chains and where worship of the blighted old gods persisted. So it was that Andraste beseeched her husband to be the spear point of a holy crusade to bring the light unto those wicked lands. Thus, the exalted march against the Tevinter Imperium began. In minus 180 ancient, Maferath and Andraste crossed the waking sea at the head of a massive horde of Alamari warriors. With the bitter rage of centuries of imperial oppression in their hearts, and the spiritual fervor of the Chant of Light invigorating their souls, these tribal marauders cleaved northwards through what is now the Free Marches with ease. During these initial stages of the invasion, the Empire offered little meaningful resistance. Still dealing with the caustic political turmoil in their northern heartland, while continuing to suffer immensely from post-Blight natural disasters, they could not bring the full might of their armies to the southern front. As such, Maferath's dynamic military leadership dismantled whatever piecemeal Tevinter forces they encountered, while Andraste's preachings kept their soldiers inspired by holy purpose, determined to drive deeper into imperial lands. One internal turmoil that prevented Tevinter from contesting Andraste's advance was a rising epidemic of slave rebellions in its major cities. Long had the children of Arlathan, 
the once immortal dreamer peoples of Thedas endured the indignity of magister chains and watched as their wives and children were put to the knife for idolatrous blood sacrifices. The elves had lost much of their language, culture and identity during their centuries of bondage, but they had never lost their pride and with that in their hearts, they rose up en masse against their masters. According to the Chant of Light, the elven revolt into Vinter was led by a man named Shata, who spearheaded a successful uprising in the city of Voldorma, and then ambushed and annihilated the Imperial Legion, which had been sent to quash it. Shartan then rallied any elf in the Empire who would come to his banner, and marched south to join forces with Andraste. This united coalition continued their northward grind for the next ten years, but the further they fought into the Empire's heartland, the more stiff resistance became. What started as a blinding blitzkrieg soon turned into a nearly ten-year slog. Up until this point, individual Tevinter Magisters had been too concerned with putting out the fires in their own provinces within the Empire to pool their manpower against the holy horde at their gates. However, as Andraste, Mafarath, and Shartan began closing in upon Minrathals in minus 171 Ancient, the sorcerer lords finally put up a united front, forming a massive host of legionnaires and battle mages, then meeting the invaders in the hinterlands outside the imperial capital, a place called the Valarian Fields. Like with everything else in this era of history, the story of the epoch-making Battle of Valarian Fields is shrouded in religious myth-making. What is known is that the contest took many days, transitioned from a field battle into a siege and then back into open melee, and drenched the sunny fields of northern Thedas in an ocean of blood. Then, after a long struggle which claimed the lives of tens of thousands, the Tevinta lines broke and the Makers faithful were triumphant. The Chant of Light speaks thus, At Shartan's word the sky grew black with arrows, at Our Lady's Ten thousand swords rang from their sheaths. A great hymn rose over Valarian fields gladly, proclaiming, Those who had been slaves were now free. This was Andraste's greatest triumph, but as it would have it, it would precipitate her betrayal and downfall. After the victory at Valarian fields, Mafarath travelled secretly to Minrathos to speak with Hesarion, the Archon and supreme leader of the Tevinter Imperium. There he brokered a peace treaty that favoured him greatly, with the Empire agreeing to acknowledge the full independence of southern Thedas as a state under Mefarath's rule. However, the price the tribal chieftain paid for this was heavy. Archon Hesarion could accept the cessation of southern barbarian lands, which had always been the squalid backwater of the Empire anyways. What he would not tolerate was the rapid spread of the cult of the Maker among his people. Indeed, as Andraste's armies cleaved northwards, the religion she preached had been quickly adopted by large swaths of the Tevinter commoners, who saw it as a new beginning after their own draconic pantheon had abandoned them and become archdemons. The rapid spread of a religion that preached the subservience of magic undermined the very foundations of Tevinter society, where the Archon and his magisters utilized their boundless arcane talents to exert control over their people. Shortly after this meeting, Tevinta battle mages, disguised in plain clothes, were allowed to enter Andraste's provisional stronghold in Navarra city. Taking the prophetess completely by surprise, the infiltrators accosted and captured her, carting her back to Tevinta. To secure peace and independence, Mafarath sold out his own wife. In Chantry teachings, Mafarath is traditionally reviled as a petty wretch who, believing the victories won should be accredited to him and not the Maker and his ordained prophetess, conspired to eliminate his wife so that he may claim sole credit and glory. Historians have since disputed this narrative, claiming that Mafarath's actions, while no doubt brutal, were ultimately pragmatic. After Valarian Fields, while the Tevinter military had suffered heavily, the Alamari war effort had also begun to flag hard. Many of their most experienced war captains had perished at Valarian Fields, and before that, in the interest of a lightning advance, they had left most of the fortresses they had captured ungarrisoned as they marched north. This had allowed Tevinter forces to reclaim those positions, 
from which they posed a serious threat to the Alamari rear. Finally, with the Alamari coalition having wreaked so much havoc in the Empire's heartland, Mafarath must have known it was possible that the Archon would use the external threat posed by the Barbarian Horde to unite his people, end the civil unrest which had been so critical to the invaders' success thus far, and bring the full might of the Empire to bear on an exhausted Alamari expedition. Carted to Minrathaus, then paraded before the crowds of the Imperial capital, Andraste's execution was to be a cruel one. Bound to a stake and set atop a wooden pyre, the spiritual bride of the Maker was to be burned alive as a brutal example of what happened to those who defied the Imperium and the supremacy of its mages. However, as the flames beneath the Prophet's feet were lit, a foreign sensation overcame Archon Hesarian – guilt, and more so, pity. As the flames slowly consumed the Lady Redeemer, the Archon, who had ordered her slow and agonizing death, now stepped forth with a blade drawn, piercing her heart and bringing a quick end to her suffering. Andraste's holy war was brought to a close with this act of mercy. After the hostilities, Mafarath retreated south to administer his new independent tribal domains, which he split among his sons. His eldest child, Isarath, was given the lands which now constitute Ole. The middle child, Evrian, was given what is now the Free Marches, and the youngest, Gerald, was given the city of Navarra. Mafarath himself returned to his eastern homeland, ruling over the Alamari tribes of what is now Ferelden. For their part in the war effort, Mafarath granted the followers of Shartan a new homeland. For the first time in nearly a millennium, the Elfhen had their freedom and a homeland to call their own. Tens of thousands of them would make the long and perilous walk to their new country, which they called the Dales. There they laboured to restore the aeons of knowledge which had been lost to them since the fall of Alathan. All the while, from the arid deserts of the Anderfels to the swamps of Ferelden, the cult of the Maker continued to spread, for the death of Andraste had served only to turn her into a martyr, who the faithful claimed had now taken her place by the Maker's side in Paradise. In our next episode on the history of the world of Dragon Age, we will explore the events which led to the founding of the Chantry, the process of how Andrastianism became the dominant religion on Thedas, and the collision course the growing juggernaut of religion and its predominantly human followers were set on when tensions began to rise with their old allies, the Elves of the Dales. If you don't want to miss the next episodes, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we will catch you on the next one.